All right, welcome back to another episode of the Blasters and Blades podcast. I almost said the old name, but but I didn't, so so you're welcome. So uh, hey, all you crazy sci-fi and fantasy fans, it's time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the Blasters and Blades podcast. Just three nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions and fantastical fantasies. A place where magic is king, the sky is the limit, and space is the place. So without further ado, we are going to introduce you to our lovely guest with that glorious beard, uh, Mr. Aaron Hawkins. So Amazon's says ac haskins i said hawkins it's haskins sorry <laughs> about that i i reads real good he's uh, putting AC, you in a wheelchair already, man. <laughs> so uh, ac haskins aaron is a former armored cav officer and combat veteran turned economist and business strategist and occasional firearm instructor he has lived a long life uh, has a lifelong love of speculative fiction. <laughs> See, this is why I normally let the guests do it. Having written his first science fiction novel as a class project in the 11th grade, uh, he has interests include, but not limited to, ancient and medieval history, mythology, applied violence studies. I like that. Tabletop gaming and theoretical economics, where he lives in Michigan with his wife, two dogs, or two cats and a dog. Uh, and I've got to ask, but uh, what was the first novel? Uh, it was a sci-fi like autobiographical far future thing that i wrote yeah it was essentially we had to do this junior project for my gifted english class and and uh that was what i decided to do and it I mean, it was like a novella about about 40 50 000 words but okay. got me a a or a minus something like that good enough do you still <laughs> have it 50 000 words i do have it somewhere um, I know my dad has a copy of it somewhere. I don't know if I still do. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. So if you were going to introduce yourself and not stumble over your words like a drunken person, I swear I'm sober, people. What would you say about you, Aaron? Um, I am a bit of a dick. <laughs> well, you were an officer. It goes with the territory. Hey, 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 hey. Um, Easy there, Soren. <laughs> oh, Whatever. I, I'm a, a giant geek who likes guns and history and economics and math. Oh, Riker. <laughs> well, I think he puts like, Riker's beard to shame. He does put Riker's beard to shame. Yeah, He's like a cooler version of Bill Riker. Riker. So let's let's cool it with that comparison. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, by the way, congratulations! I haven't talked to you since you got married. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's uh, it's been a weird year for forever. I think I posted when you posted like congratulations, but that doesn't really count. Yeah, I mean it's like it, it you know it it's been a while since I've seen anyone in person, so you know. <laughs> Fair enough. So speaking of having seen people in person, so we'll start with you, Saska. How did you meet the one, the only, the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. A. C. Haskins? Uh, I met Haskins at a Dragon Con part room party, actually. Uh, where actually, first nope, time. nope. <laughs> so, yeah, no, that's actually the first time you remember talking to me because you were that, uh, makes that makes sense. Rather into your work, uh, twenty ounce arm curl workout. We'll say that libations so. were involved. It's me. Libations are generally involved in some way. What, a Dragon Con at a room party? Same. They don't have rebels there. Um, but yeah, no. So that's where we met, but we actually talked more at Liberty Con one year. Yeah. A couple of years ago when you were trying to get the Andromani Navy going in the uh, David Weber Honorverse group. Yeah, that... that. Ended poorly <laughs> for me. <laughs> um, I don't even know what that means, but we'll go with it. You know, it's okay. You don't need to know what it means. There's, don't ask, don't tell. Inside anyway, jokes for fun. <laughs> okay, well, well, we'll assume all the nerds and nerdettes out there know exactly what we're talking about, and we'll move on. So, Nick, how did you first become aware of uh, Mr. Haskins? Uh, when you posted the show notes, um, I, as the, uh, <laughs> I, Hey, I'm going to tell you like it is officer to officer. Um, I brought up, I was brought on the show to bring in the, the comic book geekery and round it all out that I'm a sci-fi yeah. nerd as well, but, uh, no, but these two have actually 
kind of opened up my eyes and introduced me to to new works of fiction that I can read and enjoy. So I, I'm happy that he's here. I thought all you officers had like secret decoder rings that you just like twisted special signals and you knew everybody. Yeah, but it's separated by branch. He's yeah. all right. oh. It's not like the Freemasons. You don't actually have to know each other. You just have the secret handshakes. Okay, okay. That makes it makes so much more sense now, Saskia. You know, so, at the end of the infantry one, we do finger guns. Oh yeah. Pew pew, I get that. Uh, I just didn't worry about it. I was female and a medic. I generally was accepted. I've seen the medical core one, and when they're done with their handshake, they put their two fingers like this on each other's jugglers. It, it was it was kind of it's kind of weird, but we'll go with it. So <laughs> hey, I you actually... know how to always call a medic, right? In in downtown mm -hmm. San Antonio, they're the only ones with tracks that are healthy from practicing IVs on each other. I've been to San Antonio; they they do stick out. Anyway, I'm sorry, Jay. <laughs> It's okay. So I actually found uh, found Aaron through our friend Christopher Ruccio, Rocky, however you say that man's name. We'll get him to tell us, and we'll still mispronounce it. Uh, I'll blame the hearing loss, but mostly it's probably before I would have messed that up. But uh, I reached out when, when the shenanigans went happen, and they tried to cancel some Bane stuff. And I said, well... You know, the least we could do is let some of their authors come on and talk, talk the words. So, so we invited, uh, so I asked, Hey, who do you have that would make a good interview? And he said, we've got this guy, Aaron, you have to talk to him. <laughs> and I, then really he didn't, I didn't realize AC Haskins was Aaron Haskins. <laughs> See, I didn't either. Cause he had me prepping show notes, looking for him under Aaron Haskins and Google and Bing <laughs> and Duck, Duck, Go and Amazon and Barnes and Noble all were like, I don't know what the heck you're talking about, kid. I gotta make it hard for my coworkers to find my alter ego. That makes in, sense. My, in my defense, it's been a very long, very busy year. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right, so we're gonna get this party moving. Uh, Saska, your favorite question or one of them is next, and I'm gonna let you ask it. Ah, oh, religion, Star Wars, Star Trek, or Firefly? <sighs> Firefly, but with caveats. So Firefly, Firefly is the greatest show of all time, no question, and I'll fight anyone who says otherwise. Um, but Star Trek I, has a nostalgic factor for me because that was like family TV night when I was growing up. We didn't, we didn't have cable when I was growing up, and whenever we were in a place with cable, we would like weekly watch the new Next Generation episode when it came out. Um, and then Star Wars has a special place in my heart just because of the, uh, what is now legends, but the, what used to be known as the extended universe um, or expanded universe, whichever it was. Um, but yeah, I, I, uh, I was the nerdy kid, the nerdiest kid at band camp. I'm not making that up. And I would be like out on the bleachers reading a star Wars novel while everyone was like, you know, being social with the other band geeks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, since this is also a fantasy book we're talking about, mm -hmm. what is no, your religion? No, no, no. You're, no? Missing the, you're missing an important question. Follow-up. What, what instrument did you play? French horn and mellophone. So you were a blower and a beater. Okay. Not, no, the wow. those are both blowing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was in the so band Aaron once, too. So down on the blow. Got it. Okay. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's band humor joke, Nick. You wouldn't understand. <laughs> Nick was too I played cool the for that stuff. No, <laughs> I was not too cool for that. I played the bagpipes. It was cool. We got to wear kilts. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. All right. Well, I have zero musical talent. I have been scientifically diagnosed as having zero rhythm or musical ability. <laughs> so definitely never me. But on to fantasy, because that's the fun stuff. So when it comes to fantasy, your religion, Game of Thrones, Lord of the Rings, or Potterverse? Um... Of those three options, I'd probably go Lord of the Rings. Um, I Game of Thrones was fantastic, but George R. R. Martin's written himself into a corner and is never going to finish that series. And I, no, no, no. He has finished it. He's just not publishing it until he's dead. Possible. But yeah, he honestly, like, and, and the show obviously just went off the rails after about season five. So that, that, that kind of got written off. Um, I loved Harry Potter as a kid. It's you know it's still got nostalgia factor, but of them, I, I, as far as story goes, I'm gonna go with Lord of the Rings. I can understand that. So. I said I hate elves. 
absolutely hate Tolkien style elves. Why? Because they're too tall? Every because they're pretentious. Thank you. <laughs> every Thank you. every D and D character and Shadowrun character I have ever played has been racist against elves. <laughs> well, as long as I, I usually play as a dwarf paladin, I hate elves myself. <laughs> I can't stand them, filthy creatures. You know, I, it's okay. Pretentious <laughs> a holes. I like wood elves though. The nerdery is strong today. <laughs> Okay, so which one was your first love, though? Science fiction or fantasy? Um, I neither mythology really. Okay. Uh, yeah, I grew up on uh, Bullfinch's mythology as a as a little kid. That was like one of the books I learned to read with. Um, and then uh, I guess I transitioned into sci-fi next. Um, Heinlein was a was a big part of my of my childhood. My dad had dozens of Heinlein books. So I kind of grew up reading all of his, his young adult novels or juveniles or whatever he called them. Um, and then uh, transitioned to fantasy sometime around middle school, I would guess. Okay. So what is it that you love about the fantasy genre though? Because that's what you're writing mm -hmm. right now. So I know better than to put you in a box yeah. and think you'll stay in one genre. Oh yeah. I'm already planning a sci-fi, but the, uh, the fantasy appealed to me because it doesn't have to be real. <laughs> no, sci-fi, sci soft sci-fi annoys me. You know, space opera is fine for what it is, but like, if I'm gonna be, if, if I'm gonna write sci-fi, then it's gotta be hard sci-fi, which means that you gotta do the work to make it real. You gotta follow the laws of physics and, and all that with, with fantasy, I can I can make stuff up, and it's uh, just it's a more fun sandbox for me to just play around in. That is very understandable. Um, so, Nick, your turn. <laughs> Nick's debating how he says Heinlein now. I, I, yeah, you, you completely questioned my entire existence. existential crisis over here. <laughs> I was like, is Heinlein? If I I've been saying it Heinlein this whole time, am I wrong? I have no idea. It's I not heard okay. Say it, so I went to school with a girl whose last name was Heinlein, spelt like the authors, and yeah. I did ask her. She was not related to him. Um, well, yeah, she goes. I can tell somewhere. every science fiction fan out there because they always ask me that, and it was she pronounced it Heinlein. Fair okay. enough. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe he pronounced it differently. I'll have right. to rethink my life after this question. I've, I've just, that's like the third guest in a row that said it. And I'm just like, <laughs> I question okay. my own. Oh. We love you. We brought you I, on. I know. Fine. I'm just, I, yeah. Like you said, I'm in an existential crisis. I have to question everything now. What, what is up? What is down? What is real? Welcome what is to that? the book nerd corner. <laughs> and moving <laughs> to our next question. Uh, what's your first memory of engaging in the uh, fantasy genre? Um, that's a good question. Probably reading it. Uh, probably the Redwall books, I would think. Okay. The, that's that's the first time I really remember it. I would say use, using the verb engaging with it. Um, and where did you discover it? Like library, someone passed off the book? Combination of library and my brother. I think my brother got the flu and he had a couple Redwall books that, that my mom checked out from the library for him. And I just read them after he was done with them. And I, I'm pretty sure that's that's where I where I first got into fantasy in that sense. So we have your older brother to thank for your love of fantasy and the flu. Uh, I would say really my parents to thank, but mostly my mom. <laughs> and the flu. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> can't, can't forget that part. How did your love of the fantasy genre transition into you writing stories within it? I get bored with fantasy these days. Like it, it seems like every, particularly like high fantasy story is the same. You see the same tropes over and over again. So I wanted to play with it. Um, but if you really want to know where this book came from in particular in writing, writing this story, um, I was, I believe watching the show Castle and I thought a mystery would be easy but I'm going to go with magic. 
And then after about writing about three chapters, I was explaining it to my best friend what I was writing. And he said, oh, so you're writing the Dresden Files. <laughs> I had read the Dresden Files at the time. So I immediately picked up the first book and read it and went, ah, crap. <laughs> I hate it when that happens. There, yeah, so it turned out that the I had Files, Ilona Andrews, yeah, Hamilton, they all do it. I had done exactly what I hated with fantasy, which is written a story that someone else had already come up with. So, <laughs> so then I had to step back for a while and figure out how I could make my my character and story and world different enough that I would that I didn't feel like I was ripping off Butcher. <laughs> I've done that. I was four issues deep into writing a comic book series. Then I realized that I was rewriting the X Men. <laughs> you know, I I have one similar. When I was younger, I had to write a short story based off of something. So I did a fanfic of Sailor Moon and I thought I was oh so creative. And because nothing about the outer planet scouts had come to the States yet. I was like, I'm going to do Sailor Saturn. <laughs> Sailor Saturn, totally. Yeah. Like, yeah, I, I, I don't know if I should take it as a compliment that I really kind of look like I cheated off of that, but I didn't <laughs> even know it existed. Oh, well, that I think that's the most embarrassing part. But yeah, just, you're plugged into the zeitgeist. So, yeah. luckily, my teacher still gave me a good grade because she understood that I didn't watch much TV. So, <laughs> like, I watched Sailor Moon, which is 27 years old. She's my favorite 27 year old. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, many authors let their own real life experiences uh, influence the stories that they tell. Were there any specific formidable moments in your life that uh, shaped you as a storyteller? I, I'm not, I wouldn't say any specific moments. Um, I, I definitely, some of my experiences in Afghanistan definitely led into this book. You know, it's kind of a deliberate choice because I, a significant chunk of this book I started writing while I was in Afghanistan, so it was uh, a lot of a lot of the the cynicism and just bitterness and frustration that I felt at the time kind of kind of bled into the character. Um, but yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say anything specific. I tried very hard not to write a Mary Sue character, and I think I succeeded because no one in their right mind would ever want to be Thomas Quinn. <laughs> um, Oh, yeah, don't worry, I, we'll get to that question, sir. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That was oh, a good answer. My love of scotch has played into this character. <laughs> I love scotch. scotch okay. Scotch. <laughs> I do just you want think the hold on. real scotch in the book. <laughs> what? Do you, so I was talking with another writer friend and we were discussing something. But do you feature a real scotch in the book? Like so, when you're talking about a scotch in it, I haven't read it all yet. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's fine. Uh, no, several. I, I actually got the feedback. Um, my dad was one of the first people who wasn't an alpha or beta reader to read the book because I sent him a copy before before it actually hit stores. Um, and his feedback for me, like you know, he he liked the book and and he had you know good things to say about it. He said the one real criticism that he had was. Maybe I mentioned specifically which whiskey the main character is drinking too often. <laughs> and, which, you know, like when I'm writing it, that's weeks apart. So I don't even notice that. But when you're reading it, it's like that was, you know, 20 pages ago was the last mention. <laughs> and let the record. I had other people tell me they enjoyed that aspect of it. So, I, you know, I guess it depends on your opinions of scotch. I think it depends on how much of a scotch drinker you are. Mm hmm. Let the record reflect it was the guest that brought the booze up this time. Just, just <laughs> throwing that out there. We might have had an episode where we were a little tipsy, maybe, in theory. I um, guess thought it was I, a good I idea. Definitely, I definitely was. All right. So speaking of the military, since your bio mentioned you served in the U.S. Army as a CAV officer, uh, don't worry. We do <laughs> forgive you. Um, we ask all of our authors who also served in the military this question. But how do you feel like your time in the Army affects the stories you tell? Um. I kind of answered that a bit in my last question, in the my last answer, I think. But um, <laughs> that was very that was very direct to this novel. I'm talking more broadly. I'm assuming that since this is published, you're already moving on and writing more things. Yeah. No. So I I would say um, you know I don't I definitely don't want to write myself into a corner where every character I write and every story I write is about the military. Um, 
but I would say that something that I will that I will be unsurprised if it if it's a recurring theme in my stories are um, uh, military bureaucracy is awful. Yes. Um, military leadership is uh, very hit or miss. <laughs> and uh, that was awesome. And um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I, there's a reason I got out of the military. Let's say that I I, I don't regret serving. But I was not a good fit culturally for the military. And uh, yeah, I, I suspect that has played somewhat into, into some of my writing choices. Um, other than that, though, I try very hard to make, to make the, the action sequences, any firefights, anything like that, realistic. Even you, know, you got to allow for the existence of magic in this book. But even then, I try and make it so that, you know, it, it's, you know, we don't have utterly ridiculous gunfighting and 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 people doing physically impossible things beyond what are allowed by the rules of magic in the universe. Everything's very plausible. Right. So yeah. So I so there's I, not a magic tank battle. There's not a what? I would, I would be down for a magic tank battle. Dude. There's not a magic tank battle. But there will definitely be I'm writing a short story for this that's due this summer that will definitely feature a tank battle. <laughs> I'm sold. I don't think it's not going to be magic, though. Sorry. All tank Thanks battles cool. are magical. All tank battles are magical. You beat me by just a fraction of a that, second. That is very so, not true. <laughs> so, so do you ever do you ever draw from people that you knew in the military when you're writing? Oh yeah, um, yeah. I've definitely written a couple characters who were not not in not in the novel. But definitely in a couple in uh, short stories, and you know the one I'm currently working on. There's definitely people who I, I served with are are influencing some of the characters for good or bad. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Dude, you went a little high pitch right there, guys. Yeah, it's it's like, it's not <laughs> bad in the sense that they're they're like bad guys, or I'm trying to make them dicks, but. You know, they're probably dicks. <laughs> yeah. you know, the shoe fits. Wear it. Exactly. Trust me. I, when they ask me, when they me I, there's a lot of people that are in my comic book universe. They're all dicks, <laughs> but they're my friends. I don't know. JR convinced me that writing would be fun because you can kill people in it. So. Oh, it's very cathartic. <laughs> all right. So, um, so far, every guest has agreed with you, JR. It is, but uh, we'll get back on track. So, does the ser your time in the service affect the kind of stories you engage with as a co reader, consumer? So, we've talked about how it affects the stories you tell, uh, yeah. but how does it affect the stories you read? Um, it makes me very critical of authors writing about the military who don't know anything about the military. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I, I, I would say it. I, I'm definitely drawn to certain archetypes that are that are very heavily influenced by my military experiences. So you know the grizzled old old battle worn veteran, um, the the shamming specialist, like the the sarcastic junior NCO. Like I, I whether whether the character is actually in the military or not, I think that I'm 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 very drawn to the archetypes of people that I know from my, my experience in uniform. All right. Next one's you doc. <laughs> so transitioning from the, this side, let's talk about things from the fan angle. Have you had any cool fan art or a picture of a cosplay? Cause we really haven't had a con since you published. Yeah, no, the, the book actually hit shelves two weeks ago. So no, I have not seen any cool fan art. Well, I don't know. I know some of your friends. I could see well, at least one of them whipping something up. Not, not, not as yet. <laughs> <laughs> no. So that's a challenge to all of his friends. You got to do something. So um, ha um, have you spotted your books in the wild yet? I have not. I actually planned on going to Barnes and Noble last weekend to try and see if there if there were any shelf any on the shelf. Um, but we're actually um, 
we're getting kicked out of our house. The we're we're leasing, and the the landlord has decided she wants the house back at the end of this lease in a couple of weeks. So you've been so, a little yeah. So we've been a little busy packing and and dealing with that. So I haven't had a chance yet to go to any bookstores and see if it's okay. Exactly in stock. <laughs> So basically we should tell our listeners that they should go and try and find the book for you and post it in our Facebook group for you to see. Yeah, that'd be great. I would love and to I'll, see the people holding up the book or whatnot. I'll make sure you get tagged if they do. Yeah, I, we'll I, I, yeah. And I haven't had a chance to do any book signings or anything yet, but I have had one friend mail me his copy of the book with return postage requesting I sign it. So that was kind of cool. <laughs> you slip a 20 in there? I did not. <laughs> <laughs> I asked if he had slipped a 20 in there, but I mean, if I'll bribe readers too, I'm not afraid to do it. Yeah. No, no, he, he, did not, friends. he did leave me a very nice note. <laughs> it, with me, that would be ones and it'd be like, and there's more where that came from. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how very infantry of you. I approve. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Still on. Oh, so, um, we like that fun. Okay. Uh, so I guess that would also be your funniest interaction, or do you have a, another funny interaction? Because I mean, we can still interact virtually, right? Yeah. I, I, I don't, I can't really say I've had any weird or funny interactions with fans yet because I don't think I really have fans beyond people I already know. Because you're a baby uh, author. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I have weird or funny stories with friends of mine who, you know, I knew before they became fans. But yeah, I no, I, I think it's still too new at this point to have any fun stories on that. Sorry. That's all right. Okay, so this is where we're going to talk about everything that is Aaron A.C. Haskins and what he has written. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your bibliography? What's out there already? It's short. <laughs> Um, Shorts better than non-existent. <laughs> yeah. Well, so there is, yeah, my debut novel just came out. Um, um, Blood and Whispers from Bain hit store shelves two weeks ago, literally exactly two weeks ago, March 2nd. Um, and then other than that, I have three short stories out in the wild. Um, my first one I co-wrote with my friend Chris Smith um, in Michael Z. Williamson's uh, Freehold Anthology, um, Freehold Resistance, I believe it's called. Yeah, I uh, think that's the one. That's like a novel that's made up of independent and short stories that all kind of tie together into one big story. Oh, cool. uh, he and I wrote a, a fun short story that was kind of a, a freehold take on Kelly's Heroes meets The Hunt for Red October. <laughs> um, so that was, that was fun. And then... Uh, other than that, the other two that I've written are both in the same universe as the novel. So there's one that came out last year in an anthology called Supernatural Streets. That is a kind of a backstory to my my main my the novel's narrator and protagonist. And it it's about one of the adventures that he had as you know in his formative years as a younger man. Um, and then the other one was actually uh, a short for Bain's website that was kind of a tie-in to the novel. And since I'd already written a backstory to the main character, I used that one to explore a different part of the world that I don't really get to explore in the novel because, you know, the novel's told in the first person and focused on one character. Um, so that particular short is about a gang of magical homicidal drug dealers in 1980s Philadelphia. So that, that was fun. <laughs> the city okay, of brotherly so, love. Yeah. So, so for someone who doesn't, uh, is not as intimately aware of Bane. So there's free content on Bane's website. Mm -hmm. Tons of free content. Yeah. So, you could be a spokesman for Bain right now. I'm going to put you on the spot. So so how might people engage with this? How does that all work for people who are looking for something to read and to try out and aren't uh, in Kindle Unlimited? Yeah, so you can just go to Bain's website, and then uh, every month they post a free story by one of their authors. And then when those stories pull off the website, you can usually get them in the, the monthly bundle of fiction that they have available. 
which is usually available, I believe, for a low price. It might even be free. Honestly, don't quote me on that. <laughs> I am, I am the expert. bundle's about the same price as a hardcover, okay. and you get a bunch of books in it. Hmm. Yeah, so he's asking you because I always rat, rave about Bane, and he's glad to be able to talk yeah, about it. No, I'll be honest, I, I'm not the most conscientious author in the sense that I, I don't. Bane has historically had a a massive uh, interaction with its reader base um, through through a. They were one of the first publishers that had their own forum called Bane's Bar, which recently was the subject of a lot of controversy. I'm a member. I've never really been an active participant of it. Um, so yeah, I, I'm probably uh, I'm probably one of their naughty authors and not actually interacting with the fans the way that, that a lot of them do. But, um, yeah, there's also thousands of really good quality, best-selling quality free books on their website. Yeah. yeah, and like you can yeah you can go get their their free libraries for a lot of their their back backlog. Um, they have deals, they have all sorts of, they have contests that you can enter, like writing short stories and, and they'll publish you and give you, you know, money for it if you win. In that fact, kind of so they're, they're very interactive with their fans. I just, I'm not as conscientious about that as I probably should be. So I can't In fact, they're currently <laughs> running their annual fantasy convention, uh, writers contest, their fantasy writers contest. Yeah. And then um, the other thing that's really neat, if you really love your authors, Bane, if you buy the P, the ebook from Bane, they get it's DRM free in whatever format you want, and they give a higher percentage of royalties to the authors that when mm -hmm. they're through the very book. nice. Please do. I that. know lots of different things. <laughs> I get fascinated. I get fascinated with the gears of how things work. No. Oh. And if you're going to explain to me gears, I'll sit there and listen to you. Don't ask me to to be a mechanic, but mm -hmm. any kind of gears on how systems work, I'm good. Yeah. So this well, might sound well, like this uh, this episode is sponsored by Bain. It is not. We are a free <laughs> podcast. We pay out of pocket for everything. So if you want to throw a few shekels our way to keep the lights on, we've got the buy me a coffee. Just put in there uh, <laughs> for the podcast, and, and it'll go towards the uh, the upkeep because StreamYards isn't free, and the, no. some of the hosting platforms I cost mean, a little bit of money. Dane wants to kick down a couple of ducats, keep us rolling. <laughs> <laughs> and and if you're listening, if if you like Nick's witty sense of um, all things gruff, you can go buy his comic books. No, no, no. We're not here about me. We're here about but AC now Haskins. That hold on. We've had our commercial now. We're going to get back to AC Haskins. <laughs> and I think I think it's your question now that I've derailed everything. It absolutely is. It absolutely is. <laughs> For the, my co fellow co-host here, hijacked the entire segment, <laughs> which we do all the time. <laughs> all right. So let's talk about Blood and Whispers. Yeah. Um, where did you get the premise for this universe? Um. So, like I said, I started off accidentally ripping off Jim Butcher, but no, it, it was um, in in undergrad. I I focused on ancient and medieval history, and I actually wrote my thesis on Irish druids in in the early Christian period, and studying. Bronze Age Irish history, a big part of it is studying Celtic and Viking folklore and mythology. Um, because, you know, obviously the Irish were Celts and the Vikings had a very heavy influence in, in pre-Christian, early Christian Ireland. Well, I guess early Christian mostly. Um, and so when I decided I was I wanted to write a mystery I didn't want to just write a normal mystery I wanted to somehow incorporate all of this this uh, this folklore mythology that I had studied you know I may as well not let that degree go to waste <laughs> and so I, I set out to incorporate a lot of a lot of Celtic mythology and and Norse mythology into my story and I ended up actually, if you read the book, you find you discover that I kind of combined the pantheons a little bit, which is fun. Um, but I didn't want it to just be, you know, those those two pantheons are very overrepresented in in uh, modern fantasy and urban fantasy. So I, I set out to try and incorporate some other cultural aspects too. So we have some Russian fairies, and we have some German elf or dwarves, and and. Uh, there's some references to to gin and references to uh, 
actually some Native American demons, fun things like that. <laughs> so that's really one cool. Of the supporting characters uh, is the grandson of a voodoo priest. <laughs> so yeah, it was, it was just I, I was trying to essentially take this initial core that I wanted to explore and expand it to uh, to explore you know explore a bunch of different cultural mythologies. Well, I think that's really cool because a lot of writers, when they they pick a mythology, it becomes the main mythology for their entire universe. And what you what you're describing is you took all of these world mythologies and merged them into a cohesive universe. Yeah, the the second book that I'm actually working on right now is going to very heavily feature Norse mythology, but is also going to tie in some Indian Hindu mythology. So that'll be fun. Oh, that's <laughs> fascinating stuff. I. I I didn't know you about 30 minutes ago, and now I've already ordered a book on Amazon. So, <laughs> hey, thanks for the money. Hey, did you hit the buy all button? <laughs> they haven't I, given us that. I didn't, get, really I didn't get a stimmy check. I got I got to <laughs> ration my money till Saturday, oh. then I'll hit buy all. <laughs> when they bundle it all together for you know my third born child. <laughs> <laughs> uh, before we dig in further, um, let's just take a moment and talk about your cover. Um, you got a very sexy image on that book. Um, no. Did you pick the art for yourself or was it the publisher? I did not. Um, so Tony Weiskopf, the chief publisher at Bain, um, she really likes surprising first time authors with covers. <laughs> That's kind of her thing. And unfortunately this, this past year, obviously there were no conventions that she could, she could surprise me at. So she sent it to me as an email, but she, she, you know, reached out to Todd Lockwood and who is, one of the one of the premier premier names in fantasy art, and yes. got him to do my cover, which is a massive honor. And uh, she sent me the initial the initial artwork for it, and I loved it so much that I actually had to go back and edit, I think three scenes in the book to match the cover so that that it wouldn't be inauthentic. <laughs> wow. Did they uh, did they send you a, like a print or a lithograph of the cover? For you to like frame and hang in your they office. Have not yet. They have not. No, I, I, uh, I actually probably need to ask for that. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No. Don't push it too far and ask for a signature. So, <laughs> if you go to a convention where Bain is at, they do a road show and they have these big posters on foam core boards. Yeah. That they will uh, hang the posters at to the at the road show, and sometimes that's the first time the author has seen it. Yeah. Um, they do tend to give them to the authors afterwards, or they give them to people who um, hang them at conventions for them when they're not there. Yeah, but like you know, this this past year there were no conventions, so she couldn't do that. So she, I just got it by email. So, <laughs> yeah, but I mean that's amazing. It it is really awesome, and that'll be great framed. Yeah, no, it, it's just it's such cool art. Yeah, I I, I seriously. I, as soon as she told me that, or as soon as she showed it to me, I was like, yeah, I got to go edit a couple scenes because, you know, like, I'm not going to ask him to change the art to match my current boring description of this room. I'm just going to make the room cool and match the, the art. <laughs> it's almost a depiction of me every time I finish writing a comic book, and, but instead of the background being what it is there, it's just going to be just comic book <laughs> collection. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Right. Following that, uh, what do you think makes a good fit for the genres you write, uh, science fiction, fantasy in general? Mm, I'm not sure I understand the question. Joe, so, you want to chime in? So you write. Uh, <laughs> this is this is sort of urban fantasy. Uh, so yeah. if, if obviously you like your cover, but if you were speaking of your genre more broadly, what do you think makes uh, makes a good cover? Oh, makes a good cover. Okay. Um, so my particular, the, I, the genre that I wrote in is urban fantasy, but it's kind of like a, a gritty, hard-boiled, almost noir-esque character in that. So yeah, I think some, several of the elements of this cover actually match really perfectly to that, that genre. Um, he's got alcohol in it. He's clearly depressed. It's dark. He's alone. <laughs> And then there's, you know, a, a bunch of random, I believe, I believe someone described them as D and D tchotchkes on the shelf. <laughs> so it's clearly fantasy. 
Um, and it's clearly about a depressed guy who drinks alone. And I think that, that pretty much tells you all you need to know about the book going into it. Oh, and there's a, a laptop so you know that it's in the present. I think he just dug into my life and wrote my story and then added <laughs> some cool stuff made it interesting. <laughs> all right, <laughs> drink it alone? That, that sounds like that. <laughs> All right, so let's move on to the book itself. So if you were going to give a 30-second elevator speech, what would it be? Go. No pressure. Alcoholic, broken-down, old veteran sorcerer wants to be left alone and ends up getting forced into saving the world when when he really doesn't want to and doesn't care about it. <laughs> oh, the reluctant hero. Those are my favorite stories. Yeah, exactly. No, I, I absolutely love the the – Formerly idealistic hero turned into a cynical, bitter old man. So like a lot of vets. Like a yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and in his case, he, you know, he is a veteran. He I, I explicitly made him a veteran of several magical wars and you know, law enforcement police actions, if you will, um, who's essentially taken part in a lot of atrocities. <laughs> and and no longer thinks that he's a good person or worthy of redemption. It's kind of a, a redemption story in that, from that starting point. So what, uh, what makes your novel Blood and Whispers uh, special? What makes it stand out, do you think? Um, there's no, it, it's often said, and I agree, that there's, there's no truly new stories being told. Like, every, Virtually every story that can be told has been told in one form or another. And what makes something unique and new is the way that we tell it. So I would say that it's it's just the way that I put the the various tropes and pieces together. Um, you know, it, if you want to look for commonalities, there's a lot of commonalities with with the genre, with the tropes that you see in the genre. It's, it's clearly a Celtic themed uh, magical world. He's a sorcerer who's helping the police solve a murder mystery. Um, but at the same time, he's this, this broken down old man who just really wants to be left alone. He crawl up in a bottle of whiskey and not have to deal with anyone ever again. Um, but then he, you know, he's got he's gotta saddle up and, and, and ride once more. So yeah, I, that's, I, what makes it unique, I think, is just the the way I put the pieces together. <laughs> and that's really what writing's all about, because what, what do they tell you in when writing fiction is that there's only nine stories a person can tell. Right. You know, it's finding your niche and being able to reinvent that wheel that makes it attractive to newer audiences. Yeah. So, so I try to make a a fun, relatable, but but you know, not he's not a character anyone would ever want to be. But he's someone that a lot of people, I think, can relate to at least in general. You know, they can understand him if they don't, even if they don't want to be him. Um, and it's a world that I think will look familiar enough to people to to be to get their interest, but is put together in a unique way. Like I don't think anyone's ever combined the Norse and Irish pantheons the way that I did. <laughs> and, Outside of a comic. No, absolutely not. Yeah, and and then the, um, yeah, the supporting characters I think are are, I tried very hard to make them real people. They're not just kind of you know wooden backdrops for the story to play out on. I tried to make them real, unique individuals who who have their own stories and people can relate to. Um, and I, I, as I mentioned before, I try very hard to make the, uh, the action sequences realistic yet entertaining. <laughs> okay. Well, you mentioned some tropes earlier. So what tropes do you feel like from the fantasy genre, uh, are best, uh, shown in this novel? Um, apart from the ones that I've already mentioned around the character, um, he definitely shoots fireballs. <laughs> uh, he... Hmm. I'd have to Did pull you, up tropes.com to find the specific the specific technical names for them. <laughs> that doesn't matter. Just just roll with it. You no. Know, um you know, he's he's kind of the nerdy badass. Like he he just wants to be left alone with his alcohol and his books, but 
you know, if you if you mess with him, he will definitely beat your ass. <laughs> um, I didn't get in, in, into any sword play in this book, so that'll be that'll be for a later one. Um, there's you know there's various magical tropes like I feature ley lines and and things like that. There's the veil between the two worlds. They go to the other world and visit the fairies. So the the fae is a common fantasy trope. Um, things like that. Oh, oh, and and there's a fairy market which is very pretty clearly influenced by uh, both the the floating market in Neil Gaiman's, um, why am I blanking on what it's called? Neil Gaiman's uh, is one Same about the London Underground. Oh. Um, I don't know. I'm not, I, yeah, I, I mean, Gaiman's awesome, but I'm not a, yeah. I haven't devoured his books yet. Yeah, literally blanking on the name of the book, but yeah. yeah just <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, and then uh, Neverwhere, that's the one. <laughs> the floating market in Neverwhere and the troll market in uh, the Hellboy movie. Um, I would say it's very, pretty heavily influenced by both of those. So, was the uh, the bazaars that you experienced in Afghanistan uh, influencing the way you wrote these markets? Yeah, a little bit. Um, but honestly, you know, it's as much flea market as it is as it is Central Asian bazaar. <laughs> okay. Um, Selling so bootleg DVDs. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Seska, the next question is yours. So on to the story itself. Um, you've kind of talked a bit about what makes him the unique in the field of science fiction and fantasy. But is there anything else you wanted to add um, about him? That would be like, like, does he have a hairy mole? I don't know. I'm just kidding. about he's, that. He's we want the answer. <laughs> so normally when, so he's, Normally, when you have the chosen one trope, you know, it's a young kid who's like, and it's like a, a coming of age story or, or a heroic yeah. quest story. They're often um, young and hopeful. It's very much a chosen one type of character, but he's one who absolutely does not want to be, and he's been there, done that, and rejected it. <laughs> and I think that that is a, a fun twist on that particular trope. Why did I just see Luke Skywalker at the beginning of The Last Jedi where he tosses the lightsaber? He's like, no, I don't want it. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's, he's Luke Skywalker in that, but without, you know, the awful motivation for how he became that. <laughs> and without Thank the you. weird alien, alien green milk thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, sorry. Okay, anyways, Pat, beyond, pushing past the green milk. Uh, <laughs> Do you have any memorable secondary characters you want to tell us about? Since yeah, I'd say I, I'd say there's a few. Um, let's see the, the the two cops that Quinn works with in this. Um, one of them is a petite woman who you know kind of starts off as just this stuck up. You know, I'm I'm not sure how how y'all feel about explicit cursing on here, but uh, we've done it a few times. This, okay. Yeah, she's. They have me here. Yeah, she's she's basically a stuck up bitch at the start of it, and and then we kind of under learn a bit more about why, and she ends up being a total badass. Um, she's single. She's saving anybody. Uh, she's, <laughs> I don't believe I ever I wrote her a partner. Well, you know, a a romantic partner. Um, and then her her top partner, her, her professional partner, is a black gay immigrant orphan so that's that's a fun one <laughs> he's a guy who's just kind of had to overcome every disadvantage in life and it still has like a sunny disposition so that's nice um, it's like why why universe why <laughs> exactly. yeah um you know the, not only was he an orphan he he watched his family get murdered when he was a little kid <laughs> not traumatized at yeah. all not at all um <laughs> His therapist. Oh my god. Yeah. Um, Lots of money. Quinn's, Quinn's best friend, even though he doesn't even really think of him as a friend until he realizes that he is his best friend later in the book. Um, Quinn's best friend is a several thousand year old fairy prince. Um, there's one of the one of the bad guys who ends up not being. You know, he's kind of like 
the early suspect who's easily eliminated. So, you know, it's not really a spoiler. Um, it is essentially this psychopathic fairy who, who loves, he's kind of like the kid who enjoyed, you know, burning ants with the, with the magnifying glass or tearing the wings off of, off of insects or something. He's just, he's pure malevolence given form. So that's a fun scene. <laughs> yeah. So I, 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 like I said, I tried very hard to make the side characters, not just one dimensional backdrop. They all kind of, I put a lot of thought into all of them. Definitely sounds like you did. So this is uh, the fun question. What would your characters do if they met you in a back alley somewhere? Um, that depends on the context in which we're meeting in the back alley. <laughs> After you put them, everything you've put them through in this book, how yeah, would they interact? They were, like, like, they were the ones luring me into the back alley. Um, they were like, hey, look. Oh, by the way, the guy walking into that alley, that's A.C. Haskins. That's the one responsible yeah. for what happened. I actually, I don't think that any of the main characters, you know, the, the protagonist or any of his main support characters would have anything super bad to say about me. You know, they, they might have some strong words about how I wrote some of their pasts, but, but uh, <laughs> yeah, um, no, some of the, some of the bad guys, yeah, they, they might be a little more upset about how I had them end. <laughs> but in you know, if we met in a back alley, they'd be dead because I wrote them as dying. So we're good. <laughs> <laughs> and from now on, any character he thinks doesn't like him, he'll just kill them. Exactly. And every time a reader complains that Stark will die, wait, wrong series. <laughs> <laughs> you no, know, I, I never liked the Starks. I was always uh, I was always a Dorn fan. House Martell. <laughs> Yeah, okay. he wears a helmet now, though. Um, <laughs> <laughs> huge Mando fan, obviously. <laughs> and a fan of the series. Uh, <laughs> all right, uh, so what can you tell us about the universe? You've talked a little bit about it. Um, actually, a little bit more than a little bit, quite a bit. But um, <laughs> uh, in many series, the world is just as much a character as the protagonist itself. So um, can you give us a little hint of what to expect from this, from this expansive world you've created? Yeah, so it's, um, I mean, it's set in the real world just with a magical twist on it. So it takes place in Philadelphia, and I I love Philly. It's, it's I consider it my second hometown, even though I've never actually lived there. Um, my grandparents lived there when I was growing up. Actually, my grandpa still lives there. Um, so we spent every summer and and uh, about half of our Christmases in Philly. So I, I love Philadelphia, and I think it's heavily underrepresented in fiction. So I, I decided to set my story there. Um, and I tried to feature a lot of real places in it and, and references to Philadelphia. So anyone who knows Philly should should enjoy it. Did you um, cover the cheesesteak? <laughs> there is no cheesesteak in it, no. <laughs> How <laughs> but, can um, you do that? Yeah. No, it's, uh, Quinn, Quinn's... Quinn's an old guy. He, he, he doesn't do new foods. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, uh, and then I, like every, every location that occurs in the real world is either a real place. Like he goes and visits the, uh, the monastery of St. Mary and, um, in the Sinai, which is supposedly where they have the, the Moses's original burning bush and is at the foot of, of the I've been there. It's at the. Uh, it's right next to Saint Catherine's Cathedral. Yeah, Saint Catherine, not Saint Mary. You're right. <laughs> That's the one. Um, no, I wasn't trying yeah. to, to correct you, but yeah, it's, no, it's no, a cool place. No, it's, honestly, I I've never actually been there. I've only I've only read about it. So um, if, if yeah. you ever go, there's a stairway in the front, which is hard mm -hmm. to climb. But if you go to the back of the mountain, there's an easier trail. Fair enough. <laughs> well, he doesn't actually go up the mountain. He just goes for the library. Because it's got one of the oldest libraries in the world there. Oh, it, and, and yeah. you can tell by the smell. I mean, yeah. not in a bad way, but you know, like old books smell. Yeah. I want to go. Yeah, so cool. So I, I, an old library. I, I'm excited. No, I, I think my favorite old library I've ever been to is the one in uh, in uh, Trinity in Dublin. Right. Um, the yeah. So he 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 goes there. Like every every place that 
is a named location in the book is a is a real place or it's in the other world and the other world is obviously heavily influenced by by irish and celtic mythology i mean that's the name itself comes from from irish mythology um but in this universe it's the land of the fey and all of the fey live there regardless of what pantheon we're talking about and in this universe essentially every pre you know pre-christian religion every pantheon that you see is some variety of fairy so we have the Olympians, we have the uh, the Egyptian gods, the Netair, the, we have the Norse gods, we have the Irish gods, we have uh, Hindu gods. They're all they're all the Fey in this particular universe, um, and they're they're native to the other world, although a lot of them live on Earth. Um, and so that that was a a fun part of the universe to to write, and a big piece of the story is kind of the relationship between those two worlds. Awesome. All right. Uh, Blood and Whispers appears to be a standalone novel. Um, so is there is the story done? Is it going to expand? What what can we expect out of this? Is it, it is not series? a standalone. I, so I wrote it so that I could, like, if, if Tony decided that she was done with it, then I didn't need to write anymore. Like, it could end there. But I left enough, I left enough loose ends that I can clearly expand on it. And so I'm, I'm actually... Um, I already signed a contract for the next book, and I'm I'm well underway. Uh, I yeah, I have a due date for it and everything, so there will be a sequel. <laughs> is there a working title? There is not a working title. It's literally currently called Untitled Thomas Quinn Novel Two. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going with that. Will you correct? Will you correct your grievous error in not including the Philly cheesesteak in the city of brotherly love? There will probably be at least one Philly cheesesteak. Yes. Yes. Okay. Do you, do you, do you, it's meat and cheese. It's amazing. Oh, you, no, I, I love cheesesteak. It's one of my favorite food. My, I'm very disappointed that I can't get a decent Philly cheesesteak more than about 50 miles from Philadelphia. I have tried. It's terrible. <laughs> because they want to use like shredded cheese instead of uh, cheese. Yeah, or like mozzarella or they use, the real issue is the bread because it, what, what makes a proper Philly cheesesteak is the fresh Amoroso roll, and you really can't get that outside of Philly or its immediate environs. I, I remember I was actually in New York for work once, and I discovered a bar um, that uh, it was a Philadelphia bar, and they got Amoroso dough, dough shipped up to them, like trucked up to them every morning from nice. Philadelphia so they could make proper cheesesteaks. That's going to be a really long so, drive. So Pat's or Gino's? So actually, my uncle and I once uh, went there, and we each got we got one of each, and then we each had half of the uh, of of them and compared. And uh, I like both. I, I, Me too. I was told that yeah. was heresy when I lived there. Yeah. No, I I could take one or the other. <laughs> I, I enjoyed both, and it was packaged in dry ice and shipped over to us in Iraq. <laughs> and my oh, roommate guys. was like was was gracious enough to share a smidge. <laughs> so so when, when you lived there, since we're talking about the setting and it's set in Philadelphia, did you make the run up the Rocky Steps? So as I said, I've never actually lived there, but yes, I have run up. The when, you, when you visited, I'm sorry. Yes, I have run up the Rocky Steps and done the whole arms in the air. And, yeah. Outstanding. <laughs> Outstanding. Okay, I, I'm stealing your thunder, Nick. You can ask the next question now. Or no, <laughs> no, no, no. It, it's Bro. Seska. It's I Seska. know. Aliens and fantastical creatures. So I assume you have some because it's fantasy, right? Mm -hmm. So what kind can we expect? Uh, the Fey are pretty heavily involved. Um, so we we have various types of fairies. Um, the main ones are are what I titled the High Fey or the uh, what the Irish call the Ashtitha. Um The which basically that those are the ones that I, I said like every every major pantheon was one was one of them. But there's also lower fey where we have like uh, there's a, a Rusalka who's a Russian fairy that are known for kind of seducing and drowning men. <laughs> and uh, and there's um, there's a Puka who's an Irish shapeshifter fairy. So there's various types of fairy. So um, in the universe, there's also like monsters that are created by curses. Mm -hmm. They don't feature in the book as much. They do feature in that short story I mentioned about the, the drug dealing 
monsters in the in the 80s so yeah there's and then there's actually several magical species that are native to earth and humans have just kind of overlooked because we're not superstitious like I, the the nibelungen are are germanic dwarves who live in the black uh who live in the black forest um and they you know they're every german stereotype ever except anti-semitism <laughs> later hosen do they have the later hosen I didn't describe how they dress, but they, they are the ones who run the trains and run the taxis and make sure everything happens on time in this universe. So, <laughs> it sounds like you pulled a lot. What? We did not always wear the later hose. So it sounds like you pulled a lot from lore around the world. Is there mm -hmm. anything you made up and did or like this is the AC Haskins special on it, and how did you come up with it? Food poisoning, a night of too much scotch, or just a what if? I, I, I mean, let's categorize, categorize it properly, Cisco. I don't think there's anything that I just made up whole cloth. I tried to have some kind of basis in mythology or lore uh, for everything that I put in there, but. I made it very clear and even have one character at one point explicitly say that, um, you know, folklore and legends are tales told by someone who told someone else. So there's all you, you it's always playing the telephone game and everything is, you know, distorted that you hear. So that, that was kind of my out for not being strictly true to what you've heard in folklore and mythology. Um, okay. That you know, I I could put, always put my own twist on it and say, oh yeah, the reason that the reason that you heard differently is because you heard a story told by someone who told someone else. Yeah, I mean, nor mythology and folklore is inherently a oral history, which is uh, definitely exactly. doing. Yeah, so I I got to play around with it, but I don't think I made anything up just completely whole cloth. No. Is there any mythical creature that is not in this book that? you are really looking forward to putting into uh, future books. Like a, like a personal favorite that just didn't quite make it into this, into the confines of the story. Um, Vulcan elves. Yeah. So there's um, one and I'm actually blanking on what they're called. Yeah. Not token elves. Definitely not. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm blanking on what they're called. It starts with a V um, and they are a, kind of hybrid vampire werewolf undead thing um, from Slavic and, and Eastern European mythology. And uh, I am I am looking forward to including them in the next book. <laughs> okay. That was a that was a good follow up. Um, <laughs> I so. hold on, I, I found it is Vrai Kolakas? Yes, yes, that is it. <laughs> yes, because you. You broke up. You broke up for a second, uh, Aaron. You said what? I believe that's actually the Greek name for them, but yes, it's the same concept. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's 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 uh, very similar to the whatever the Balkan name or the Slavic name for them is, but yeah, it's it's uh, yeah, Brachalakis or something like that. Yeah. I, I put a lot of words in this in this book and in other books that I have no idea how to pronounce. It's just, you know. <laughs> You're poor narrator. <laughs> yes. No, so so there is going to be an audio book, and they have not contacted me at all about how to pronounce anything, so it's going to be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of calls. 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 Sorry. Wow. Okay. So with history, historically accurate things, they already know how some of that works. Yeah. You know. So, and, um, but yeah. So was there anything about blood and whispers that we didn't ask before we wrap this up that you want to tell us about? I don't think so. I would say I'm, I'm very much a gun guy and I tried very hard to, to incorporate that into the story in the book. So if you enjoy guns and shooting, I think you will, you will appreciate the action sequences in this. It's not an action book, but there are several firefights anyway. <laughs> so what you're saying is that fans of Larry Korea would be okay with this novel. Hopefully. 
All right, like I said, it's not an action book. It's definitely a lot less action and shooting than, than in Larry's books. But what is in there, I tried very hard to make both realistic and yet entertaining. Okay. I'm going to oh. start asking me all the products he put in his hair because it's magical, along with that beard. <laughs> I mean, I was going to ask him. I my hair, it's Hans de Fuco quicksand. Thank you. Now I don't have to wear a ball cap every time we're on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you said you, you were a gun guy and you included some of that. Uh, that's for you there, Nick. Uh, you said you were a gun guy and you included some of that in this story. So do you have a favorite weapon? Um, Not really. I, I, for me, weapons are tools, so it depends on what it is that you're trying to do. That said, my daily carry is probably my P365. Um, I will. I occasionally strap on a, a J frame if I don't feel like putting on an undershirt because the P365 is has a very uh, rough pistol grip and uh, it chafes. It chafes. I don't have an undershirt. So, it chafes. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I will um, say this: it not to sound. Like I'm hitting on you because I'm not. You've posted pictures in the past a couple years ago where you were talking about dressing with it. Yes. You do a very good job. I try. So. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, no, I, yeah I, I actually had an Instagram for a while that was essentially showing. I hate the standard gun guy uniform, which well, is, you know, the essentially the cargo pants or tactical pants. And a unbuttoned baggy plaid shirt. Um, yeah, they either, I, they stole it. They um, either yeah. look too gung ho or sloppy, and you do yeah. a good job of actually looking like a man who knows how to dress. Yeah, my my the whole point that I had with that Instagram was like you're like, if you're just trying to get people to not think that you're armed, then don't look like a gun guy. Like, dress <laughs> that, dress, you know. If, if you have to guess who's armed, are you going to guess it's the guy in the plaid shirt and the cargo pants and the Merrill boots, or are you going to guess it's the guy in the bow tie and the vest? <laughs> or the guy wearing the three-quarter P in board shorts while he's at Costco today. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that works, too. And, exactly. and, uh, so I'm actually I'm, uh, I'm going to plug, actually, a friend of mine, um, John Hopman, who runs Filster Holsters, which is a originally a Philadelphia company. They're now actually based out of Minneapolis. But... Um, yeah, Filster Holsters just came out with a product called the Enigma, which is a system for wearing a gun. It's it's wearing a gun without a belt. And it's it's you know, belly bands have existed forever, but they're terrible. This actually works really well. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, the belly they essentially took the runcible YP holster and made it into a universal any any holster that uses a certain type of wedge can fit it. And um, I think there's three different options. And yeah, I highly recommend. They're constantly sold out because demand is so high because it's such a good product. But I love mine. So. <laughs> okay, so I think that proves his gun bona fides for you, uh, for you listeners who are going to be curious and ask those questions. I, so, I give him the infantry state of approval. He's a gun guy. Yeah, but the right, beauty so. of it is you can wear sweatpants and, and still be rocking a gun now without yeah, we're, since we're at the end of gray sweatpants season. Sorry, ladies. Yeah, but now, but now we're getting into like basketball shorts and board shorts season. So, so uh, you know what? For women, especially with COVID, yoga season's all along. Yeah, actually, it, yeah, honestly, like for for women looking for a way to carry and not have to dress around the gun, this is the ideal product for them. I'm not even joking. Like it's 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 amazing what you can what you can conceal with this thing. I'm down. I'm gonna have to get on the weight list because I need one. I need it. <laughs> All right. So clearly we're winding down this interview. So before we wrap this up, are there any updates about other forms of media coming out in the universe? You mentioned that they're going to be doing some audiobooks soon. Is yeah. there anything else coming out that you uh, you can spill here first? Yeah. So I know still here first. No, um, because I've still did a couple other places, but I know that there has been a production contract signed for the audiobook. That is the only detail I know about it. So I don't know anything about who's narrating it. I don't know about the timeline on it coming out. Tony has not told me at all. She just told me that there will be an audiobook. That's <laughs> awesome because audiobooks are expensive to, to produce. No. Um, so. Other than that, no, I don't believe that there's going to be a video game anytime soon or anything. <laughs> Possible comic book tie-in? Never know. 
All right. So how can listeners and viewers find you if they wanted to find you on the wild, wild web? Uh, my website is achaskins.com. Um, and I can be found on Facebook at AC Haskins. Um, please, if we have not actually met or, or had at least a couple of decent conversations, don't send me a friend request on my personal page because I will not accept it. <laughs> that is, that is for actual people that I know, but if you just yeah. want to follow me and for writing purposes as a fan, then I, I do have an author page at, uh, AC Haskins. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, and you can find us at our website, www. No, actually, there's no W. What am I doing? All right, it's anchor.fm backslash blasters and tack blades. Uh, anchor.fm backslash blasters, tack and tack blades. Our Twitter is twitter.com uh, backslash sf underscore fantasy underscore show. Sierra Foxtrot underscore fantasy underscore show. You can email us at blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com. We do even, Elvis likes it. Uh, we do even sometimes answer it. Uh, we have a Facebook group. It's facebook.com backslash blasters and blades. And like we said, if you want to support the show, buy me a coffee.com backslash author JR Hanley and throw in the comments. It's for the podcast. Uh, and that brings us to a close. So, Saska, do your thing. <laughs> Thank you for spending some of your precious time with us. For Nick Garber, J.R. Hanley, and I'm Doc Suska. This was Blasters and Blades Podcast. We'll be back next week at the same time where we indulge our love of everything nerd culture, cheesy jokes, all things that go boom, and whatever else weirdness pops up. Done.